Hello. Uh, really sorry for being late. So the session was supposed to start at 10, uh, uh, but unfortunately, none of the speakers are here. Uh, two of them couldn't land, and the two that were supposed to be online uh, are not online. We don't know why. So uh, we have 30 minutes. So I suggest, since you are here, those of you who are interested, uh, to share as well cases from their own countries or ideas how we can like stress more on the human rights perspective or dimensions of internet governance i'll be speaking about uh, lebanon igf uh, so the session is on the nris uh, uh, the, the national and regional initiatives uh, case studies from where, from different countries that were supposed to be here to share cases from their own countries on how, how they are working on the human rights side. So I will share the experience of uh, Lebanon IGF. Uh, I represent uh, Maharat Foundation, uh, an organization that works on media development uh, and freedom of expression, including the freedom of internet. Uh, we work in Lebanon and in the MENA region as well. Uh, the, the Lebanon IGF uh, has been conducted uh, last year, the first time in 2018, and it was supposed also to be conducted this year, 2019. But unfortunately, because we have uh, protests to, today in uh, Lebanon, uh, since 40 days, uh, the, the, we postponed uh, the IGF 2019 till we will be able to engage more with the public uh, sector. Uh, I, will, I will tell you about uh, the challenges that we faced uh, as a civil, a civil society to engage with people in the internet governance. So uh, people in Lebanon uh, think about the internet as, uh, as uh, something very technical and they, they don't relate it to human rights or to their own interests. So what we try to do is like to bring more youth within the, uh, within the, the dialogue in order to, uh, uh, to, to, to have a wider community that is engaged in internet governance discussions. Uh, we partnered with the Diplo Foundation uh, and we organized some capacity building workshops. Uh, we tried to stress on youth and as well on academics because uh, they have also, they can engage with their students. And uh, we felt that this is a strategic partnership to have more people on the table, especially that in some regions, uh, we feel that governments are not that much engaging with civil society and academia, and this was an opportunity to have a, a, a wider community from different stakeholders uh, engaged in uh, internet governance discussions. What we did is building the capacity of youth uh, on uh, internet governance issues and mainly the human rights dimensions. So we focused on four areas where we thought that it might be interesting for uh, the community. So it was uh, access. Uh, uh, we focused that the access to internet is a human right today. And like we tried to focus on the benefits of having access to the internet as an opportunity for people. Uh, uh, the second one is freedom of expression online. The third one is privacy online. And the fourth area is multi-stakeholderism. So what we did is a, a campaign uh, the campaign was called Have a Seat in order to uh, engage uh, people to uh, have a seat on this multi-stakeholderism uh, table, if you want. So we explained the multi-stakeholderism approach and, uh, and the importance of having all stakeholders at equal footing uh, on the table to discuss policies related to internet governance. And then we tried to engage with people. So uh, we like uh, uh, went to the streets and we started producing short videos asking people what do they think about like uh, the right to access internet or freedom of expression online and like uh, having their privacy protected etc in order to make them like feel that this is something that relates to them it's not just something that is uh, uh, related to tele technology and telecommunication 
uh, even we tried to engage with the journalists uh, to, to be like to follow the policies uh, uh, more like uh, closer and uh, also to be aware of the human rights dimension that should be included in every policy uh, governing uh, the, the internet. So, and uh, this year, like we uh, did uh, public consultation meetings. So we did uh, a meeting with uh, civil society organizations uh, working on human rights, areas like uh, promoting uh, accountability and transparency, gender equality, uh, uh, elections, fair elections. So we invited uh, the most prominent CSOs in Lebanon to uh, a meeting and we like, uh, discussed with them the whole process and uh, focused and stressed as well on the on the importance of being engaged in these discussions to have a human rights uh, respected uh, uh, in, in this uh, area. Uh, also, uh, we did the public consultation meetings with the universities, so we invited academics from different universities uh, in order to uh, engage with them uh, to, to, tr to transfer this knowledge to their students so that they would be engaged and to encourage them to apply for workshops. Uh, all these like activities that we've done throughout the year like uh, helped us uh, uh, stress the human rights dimension and in, it influenced uh, actually uh, the first year's uh, agenda. Uh, when we look at the sessions and workshops that were presented in the, uh, in the last uh, uh, Lebanon IJF that, were, that was organized, we see that a lot of sessions were on access to information, on freedom of expression online, on uh, balancing transparency, privacy and security. So, so the, 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 there there was a lot of uh, sessions uh, having this uh, dimension, which was like uh, a success for the civil society in Lebanon, having a voice on a multi-stakeholder platform and engaging with the public actors in order to have these like uh, uh, principles uh, on the agenda of, uh, of discussion. So uh, I don't want to speak a lot. So this is the experience of the Lebanon IGF and how we are trying uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to stress on the human rights dimension on, of internet governance. I would like to hear from you if you have any ideas from your own countries on how to promote mo more this uh, dimension of internet governance or if you want to ask me uh, about our, uh, our experience as well in engaging with different uh, communities in Lebanon in order to have a wide community that is supporting uh, IG issues and engaged in the in the policies uh, discussion. So, if you have any questions uh, or interventions, so I would be happy to take them. Yeah, please. Um, hi. So, my name is Maria Vlahakis. I'm from an organisation called Womankind Worldwide which is a global women's rights organization based in the UK. And I just wondered, we had a chat before the session started, if you could say a bit about how through your work you've tried to engage mar marginalized groups, um, including marginalized women, um, to play a more active role in the internet, and internet governance specifically, and also whether that you have any findings in relation to um, the sorts of violence and abuse that they might experience online, which I think is a, is a really big problem for a lot of women um, and actually does prevent some women from engaging in the internet and internet governance, and particularly women that um, face multiple and intersecting discriminations, because those that they face offline are often played out online as well. And in our experience, particularly with women in public life, um, even if they are active on the internet, it is censoring what they say, um, just the high levels of violence and abuse that they experience, just whether there's any insights in your work on this. Yes, sure. Uh, so, uh, uh 
I will, I will start with, uh, with what's happening currently in Lebanon. As I told you, we have protests since more than 40 days in Lebanon. Uh, uh, and we've been following, uh, uh, since Maharat works a lot on monitoring the media and uh, also m doing social listening to understand the, the discourse on social media platforms. So we have a platform that we launched since the beginning of the protests called LebanonProtests.com. So on on this platform, we have been gathering, it's an open data platform where we uh, gather the uh, tweets uh, uh, around like uh, specific hashtags uh, going on around the revolution. Uh, so we did not like do a lot of analysis. So it's an open data platform where everyone can download uh, whatever data they want and work on, on the analysis. But, uh, also, it includes a dashboard, an interactive dashboard where we studied, uh, like we, we went deeper into to uh, ag uh, aggregating, if you want, uh, uh, the, the, the activity online. And one of the findings was that despite that now uh, uh, the, the, there's the revolution in Lebanon, uh, uh, we see on the streets, on the front lines, women more than men even. So, so we try to look at whether this is reflected as well online. So when we look at this uh, dashboard, we see that the percentage of women interacting online is only about 25%, while men dominate like more than 75% of the online uh, discourse, uh, even though it is not the reality because you know, we are seeing like them more than men on the streets. Uh, on another hand, also when we studied the, the when we studied the, the the performance or the the coverage of women during the last parliamentary elections in Lebanon, it was the first time we had uh, many women candidates, more than 100 women candidates for the first time in the history of Lebanon. And when we studied as well their communication online, because it was like uh, studying how the media covered and whether, how much spaces were allocated to women in the media, but in the same time, what was their discourse and their presence as well on social media. So we saw that uh, their was presence were, was less than men in proportion to their numbers, of course, and uh, also the kind of activity that uh, they did is different. So they were only posting things related to their campaigning, their activities, but nothing like positions and stands towards what's really happening in politics in the country as men candidates were doing. So, so based on, on this study, we like tried to work more and understand why women act differently online than offline. So, and we did some focus groups and some uh, 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 some focus group to, to understand like uh, why women are not that active online or what impedes them for, from being active. And one of the things that was uh, uh, found is that they do not feel safe online and they like are subject to a lot of harassment, especially women journalists. So. Again, if I come back to what's happening today in Lebanon, we see that uh, women reporters are also reporting what's happening during the protests on the streets. And there's a huge campaign today, uh, 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 online bullying for these reporters, sharing their mobile numbers all over the internet. And uh, like uh, 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 people like using applications to mask their numbers and calling them like every second and harassing them and sending them even online uh, sending them pornographic videos, etc. So specifically to women reporters. So all, this, all these incidents like, definitely show us how much women like, face uh, uh, more violence uh, online uh, than men. And this is reflecting their activity online as well. So what we are trying to do, uh, uh, working with, with, uh, with women through training on communication, uh, uh, on effective communication, uh, and public participation. So uh, we, we tried to work with, uh, with uh, some groups, uh, female leaders, uh, on providing trainings on uh, the effective use of, uh, of, uh, of communication, including like social media, social media uh, platforms, uh, uh, understanding the, the, the challenges uh, online and being able to formulate clear messages and being active while understanding Ending all these threats, but of course, it's not. There's, it's not the solution. There, there is a lot 
to do and a lot of discussions in this regard to know uh, how we can like uh, uh, promote the protection uh, of uh, women and marginalized group online because not only women also LGBT community they face the same uh, the same threats online uh, more than uh, more than uh, other other people uh, so so uh, if you have any ideas I know this is a, a large debate all over the world how to face online harassment specifically for women so I don't know if you have any best practices in this regard on the effective use of ICT while understanding the threats and knowing how to mitigate these uh, these threats uh, online any other intervention or question or anything you want to share about your local communities the work that you're doing yeah can you come near to the mic <laughs> You're from the French, Alger. Pardon? You're from the French, Alger. Uh, Christian? Ah, Italian. okay. Cool. Hello, good morning. My name is Andrea Beccalli, and I'm here partly for the Italian IGF. And I wanted to um, bring up an example from, the, from Italy, from the Italian IGF experience. Uh, there was a panel on um, basically how the internet became a vehicle for harm and for um, um, particular heinous crimes. And, uh, and one of the best cases that was brought by the Italian IGF was the grassroots movement that was able to achieve um, a law on revenge porn in Italy. It was the first time in Italy, one of the few countries that our now has in the, in the penal code the revenge porn as a crime and with uh, all the description and the sanctions attached to that and already have been court uh, sanctioning uh, um, uh, cases of revenge porn. So they all started from um, a grassroots movement of um, internet users, mainly young uh, teenagers and girls that uh, they created um, uh, first a campaign via social media and then we're able to bring this to attention of, um, uh, of, um, of the parliament. Uh, they were quite successful because the parliament, um, already in 2015, in Italy was working on a so-called Internet Bill of Rights. And the Internet Bill of Rights set the framework where basically said that the internet has to respect and guarantee, and all the actors have to respect and guarantee also the protection of basic human rights online. So they used that as the building block. And they said, look, the parliament already uh, did a great job in, in um, establishing these basic principles, uh, but uh, they need to be operationalized. Something is missing. And, and, uh, and um, there, there were cases in Italy of uh, revenge porn of very high profile uh, that got the attention of the media of um, um, young girls uh, being uh, bullied and uh, their private videos being shared online and that brought to the extreme consequences that in one of these cases um, the victim uh, ended up committing suicide despite having denounced, despite having went to the, she went to the police to report that but the police told them look there is little we can do and of, almost she felt that um, um, you know was her fault. There was, so that really helped in creating the environment uh, in, in, um, in, you know, in the public opinion that's something that needs to be done. So the environment was there, um, the framework in the, in the parliament and the legal framework was there, but still a law was missing. Mm. So the good example that was then reported this last uh, Italian IGF that was um, held at the end of October was this initiative of a network. It was really a um, self-organized network led by 20-something um, years old, uh, mainly girls, who were able through hashtags, through creating Facebook groups online, uh, to reach the members of the parliament that already signed this declaration years back. And, uh, and they were able to bring this uh, theme uh, across the scope, so from both uh, right MEPs, left MPs, uh, center MPs, they were able to bring that to their attention, and uh, they succeeded in having this law being enacted already last year. 
So that was, I think, uh, a very interesting example of how the debate on internet governance actually is very relevant and related to the daily lives of the internet users and to the protection of their rights. And recognizing that the internet you know, brings amazing uh, um, innovation and connectivity and builds community, but at the same time can be a very, uh, a, a very dangerous um, way of bullying, of marginalizing, of criminalizing, uh, particularly when there are some um, habits uh, uh, in the society that uh, tend to do not look at these things. They said, well, it's the girl's fault or it's someone else's fault that is sharing this, uh, these images. No, now this is something that brought uh, almost a cultural change and, uh, and uh, we had uh, a panel on that uh, and uh, uh, one, one girl uh, was able to participate. Uh, four other girls who connected on online. Some of them, they were teens, you know, and 17 years old. So they, they all shared how they were able to bring this to the attention of their schoolmates and classmates. And from there, they went up all the chain to the local um, political representative, and uh, and then they reached the, the parliament and they had this law now. So that's the experience that I wanted to share, and, um, and if you want to have more information, I think the, the report from the Italian IGF has been published, and there is the whole section, a session about the revenge porn, and, the, uh, and um, that's all available, and I think will be translated in English, so far it's in, um, in Italian only. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. So any other uh, intervention or success like the Italian uh, law that has been brought. Okay, so uh, we thank you for taking part in this uh, session with one speaker. <laughs> so thank you for your interest and uh, wish you uh, a great IGF for the other sessions. Thank you.